Uh, good evening, everyone, and good afternoon on the other side of the country. Um, so I would like to um, acknowledge the traditional owner, the condonian of uh, the, the land we're on. Um, so, um, I respect the respect of the culture and the past, present, and in emerging. So I come from Turbo and the Jaguar country, which is Brisbane, central to the bay side of Brisbane. So it follows uh, the Brisbane River, it goes really out to uh, to the island. So we are surrounded by islands. So that was quite a country, it's called. Uh, it's with the flat land straight out to the ocean. And then on the back side, where the central country is all all the um, land bound hills, or what they call the other term. Uh, it was a really beautiful country before being built, and there's been a lot of stories about um, fishing and another culture and the harvesting. Uh, it was a really good country. So, um, so, I would like to introduce to that tonight. Um, it was really a bit exciting. So, I've got to be my favorite for the whole year and around this session. Um, because I would love to hear about people's stories and uh, never how that start up in their own market enterprise, uh, adventures, whatever you call it, and then the business and people with disability, very, very, very creative thinkers. Um, it's really beautiful about them. Um, so we have a guest speaker, Claire, uh, she's the project lead for the peer to peer network that have been in WA, and she's also part of the micro enterprise network that so is kind of changing tradition for now. Um, so they support people with the ability to build capacity uh, and developing like all the skill, um, evolving soft skill, but helping the skill up to the business skill, so at a more like a micro enterprises level. So it's been about good, like a social enterprise in some way, but it's more an impact of, um, of their lifestyle and experiences. So she have working team with like at least a hundred people. So that's quite a bit of a big team now to get at the journey into the entrepreneurship. So so she joined the team that's for the private expansion that are um, ILEC project. That's right. Yeah. Um, so hopefully in the transition, right, like, um, employment to self-employment that provide into the opportunity um, because we're unlocking the opportunity around um, all the um, creative idea with the people with an individual lifestyle are uh, quite amazing. And I know there's a couple of few of them in the meeting tonight. I know who have their own business. So uh, um, it's quite inspiring as well. So I'm not meant to exclude you, but there's a lot more there out there. It's the big country, big world. So um so I would like to um, hand over to Claire so she had the presentation and give you the, uh, what's happening out there. Great, thanks Matthew. Hello everyone. Um, I am Claire, but I am going to sneakily introduce my other colleague, Nadej, who's in the room with us today, uh, who will be uh, from 1 December, she tell, still tells me how many days I've got left, um, who will be taking over the Micro Enterprise Project very shortly because Valued Lives was successful in receiving a couple of other ILC grants that I'm going to head off and do. So, um, hi Nadej. Hi everyone. <laughs> Um, so what we're going to do tonight is I'm just going to quickly show you um, a little bit about uh, what we have done with our micro enterprise project and our process and then share some really cool stories with you and then we thought we'd open it up to the room to see what other questions or queries or experiences you wanted to have a chat about because I don't think that everybody wants to have death by PowerPoint from me at this time of the afternoon so I'm going to start sharing my screen or evening actually because it's only 4 30 over here in Perth um, okay where is my I've just now got it yeah okay lost my mouse momentarily okay so um, my name's Claire I am the project lead for our micro enterprise project and uh, we started the project uh, we, we joined the project um, a little bit over 12 months ago now and um, it's been a very interesting journey to say the least. Um, now I don't know why that is not working properly but we'll just continue on. Uh, 
I had it working, there we go. All right, so I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today. And where I am in Winodesh is, is the uh, Wajak um, people uh, of the Noongar Nation and uh, over here in Perth. And also want to uh, recognise their con continuing connection to land, waters and community. I also uh, I want to pay my respects to um, Australia's first people and their culture and elders past and present and any members of the community that might be joining us today. Um, so a little bit about us, how we got started. So we were a information linkages in capacity or ILC uh, funded project originally. Um, and uh, we were um, tasked with providing mentorship and coaching for people with a disability who um, wanted to try something other than the traditional employment models. So over here in WA, and I believe it's pretty similar to the rest of the country, you had um, your ADEs or Australian Disability Enterprises, um, or you had um, you know, some, some people working in open employment, but the numbers were pretty grim. Um, and then we had a lot of people a lot of people in the seemingly endless cycle of volunteering or work experience that were looking for something a little bit different. Um, so the, the project started up, we originally started with two people and managed to find a location in um, Fremantle in WA and uh, it grew from there. When Nadej and I came on board, we had about 19 people and we were tasked with supporting um, up to, I think, 30 more. And we're currently sitting at 105. <laughs> so it's been a massive, massive undertaking and uh, not even COVID could slow us down, which has been so exciting to be part of. In fact, quite the opposite. I think our busiest time was during COVID when people were at home and all of a sudden had opportunities to think about alternatives to where they were currently working or work experiencing. Um, so yeah, to date we have supported more than 100 people and we've interestingly been able to support people across Australia, which has been really, really challenging, but really, really interesting. And that was an opportunity that was largely born from COVID because um, we currently were, you know, well, we were originally just supporting people that we were meeting with face to face and that was very metrocentric. Um, but obviously when everybody started to be sat on Zoom, and uh, you know, teams meetings and online forums, we kind of thought, well, there's got to be something that we can do. And we started to get calls from across the country and in regional and remote WA too. And we decided, look, we were up front with our people and said, we'll give it a go. And if it doesn't work, well, at least we tried. And it's actually been really, really successful for us. Um, the young man that you can see there, his name's Will, and he is a gentleman who does not fit traditional employment models, struggled a lot at school, um, had to stop going to school because um, the structure there didn't work for him. However, he loved gardening. He loved getting out and mowing the family lawn, which in a tropical area like Broome, which is where he is, grows really, really fast in certain times of year. So he had a lot of work to do. And uh, actually Nadej has been working with Will to get his, his business up and running. And I was lucky enough to meet up with him last week when I, or the week before when I was there. And he's now um, gone through a proper business planning process. He's up and he's running. He's got his logo. That's him in his work shirt. That logo goes on the work vehicle and he's taking bookings around town and this is going to be a form of income for him so that's pretty I love that photo of him a um, little bit about our team so our team in of itself is unique in uh, this uh, landscape in that um, we are hundred percent peer-led so there's uh, there's eight of us in that photo um, uh, we are all uh, the parents of, or supporters of people with disability and five of us have disability ourselves. So um, we're kind of walking the walk from both ends, which is really cool. Um, we're a very noisy bunch. Poor Nadej has to say in the meetings, can the quiet people speak first? Um, <laughs> because some of us are neurodiverse and it gets pretty intense. <laughs> Um, so, what is a microenterprise? So, a microenterprise is a very small business, very small, usually has one or two people in it, running it. Um, 
And it re it's the important part about it too is it requires minimal capital to get started. And that is really important when you're talking about working with people who are on disability support pensions or new start or things like that. We, we're not about setting up something that requires a massive investment from the outset. Um, and the other part about microenterprise and the, re the ethos that we follow is that it's really down to the individual what outcome they're looking for from this microenterprise. So some of our microenterprises use um, their, their business as a way of community connection. Some of it, you, some people use, um, sell the products that they make as part of their therapies. Um, and other people have a very clear goal around financial independence. And that's fine. Whatever someone is looking for from that, um, we will, you know, support them to, to achieve that outcome. That being said, a lot of our businesses are actually doing quite well financially, particularly in recent times with some of the markets and things that we've had um, and art exhibitions that we've had. They, they're up there with, you know, their competitors. Um, just very quickly, if you're interested in having a look and we can go through the website in more detail later on, this is just a snapshot, but we also have a national micro enterprise directory and that is um, something that we also established through the grant and that where people with a disability can actually advertise their businesses for free um, and we don't make any commission or money from that. It actually is a link directly back to the business, but it's like a little bit like a virtual yellow pages and that covers across Australia. So there is a, a one stop and then there's, um, you know, one for each state. So um, you can sort of have a little bit more of a look at what we do if you're interested there. Um, come on, computer, you can do it. Oh, yeah, so there you go. There's a little bit more detail about some of the businesses. And the really cool thing about the businesses that we have is they are so varied and it's not up to us to determine what that business is for that individual. So we, I'll take you through the process that we follow in a moment, but we've had soil testers come to talk to us. We've had, we have professional party hosts, we have artists, we have makers, we have people who make dog treats, we have, oh my goodness, you name it, there's so many different things. We have a, a person whose micro business is delivering products for other micro businesses. Um, that's a relatively new one. So, you know, the sky is really the limit and it's down to what the passion and talents of that individual that we build the business around. So, why on earth would you want to consider this? So what we found along the way is that this form of self-employment is really, really valuable for a lot of people because it fits people who maybe don't fit the mainstream employment model, which they might need flexible working hours where they can do quite a lot when they're well and maybe not so much when they're not well. Um, it, it also allows for um, some of our participants who need frequent rest periods that might not necessarily fit employment situations. Um, and it also, you know, we have a lot of people who are real night owls and they prefer to do their creation and making at night and that might not, you know, fit uh, an employer's um, idea of what they need. Um, it's also around being your own boss. One of our participants said to me very clearly the other day when I asked her, I want to be my own boss because I don't want someone looking over my shoulder telling me what to do. I want to make the decisions about what happens and the way that I do things. So that's really, really empowering. Um, a lot of people have a skill or a talent that can be harnessed into uh, a really dynamic business. And the last one, which I haven't put on there, but it's emerging for some of our people, is that it can be a way of learning employment skills. Um, if you think about your resume, when you can say to a potential employer, look, I ran my own business very successfully. Um, you know, I learned how to do the books. I learned how to fulfill orders. I learned how to do visual merchandising or whatever it may be, depending on the role. Um, that has a lot of weight to a potential employer, the fact that you successfully ran a business and you know, you can, you can use that as a capacity building exercise. So that, and you know, there's, I'm sure there's more reasons that some of our micro enterprise owners could give us as to why they would do this. That's just a little bit of a brief um, overview. 
Um, so just very quickly, the journey that we undertake um, when we take people through the process. The most important one uh, to me is, um, and I'm sure Nadej would probably agree, hopefully, <laughs> is the discovery process. So the discovery process is, uh, is as long or as short really as the individual wants it to be. Sometimes we have people who come to us with really, really clear ideas about what they want to achieve or what they want to do. Other people come to us fresh out of school with really no real ideas or, uh, or thoughts about what that they want that process to look like. So we spend a lot of time um, getting to know the individual, getting to um, sort of trail along at some of the things that they might do, uh, where they might be connected in various community groups, having conversations with people that are already part of their lives, like their families or their, um, their you know, school if they're still at school or support workers or community groups that they might be connected to to really really learn a lot about that person and about where some of those hidden talents might lie that haven't been previously identified but also where the opportunities might lie and where the natural supports that a person might have um, can be accessed and harnessed to, to create success. Because ultimately, um, you know, we don't want to build something that is completely reliant on paid support um, to be a success because I think we are all very clear that the NDIS is not a constant and uh, supports can come and go. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's really, really important that we get that journey right. Um, from there, we build what we call the discovery record, and that is um, sort of a, a direction, an idea. Look, we've we've learnt this, 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 and this about you, and we think you've got these talents that we could harness and turn it into something, um, into a business. Um, the reason that is so important is because the individual has to be at the centre. They have to have ownership of what we're doing. They have to have investment personal investment and interest in what we're doing. Because if something is built around uh, a person, then it's much more likely to be sustainable and succeed in the long term. If we say, right, Nadej, I know that you like animals, we're gonna build you a dog walking business with no consultation, no investigation. The minute Valued Lives as an organization steps out of the picture, it'll all fall apart. Because Nadej is actually not really that interested in doing that for a job. You know, so you have to really make sure that you do a lot of deep dive into this stuff. So, hello. I'm just right. saying hello to my son who's come home from work. Hello, I'm just in the middle of training. Hello. Oh, God. Excuse me, everyone. Oh, yuck, you're so gross. <laughs> oh, get off. Mwah. <laughs> he works in a, um, he's a trade assistant and a heavy diesel mechanic and he stinks. Get out. <laughs> um, all right. So, Hi, Mom. on to the next. See, I'm very professional, Matthew. Aren't you glad you invited me? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next part of our, um, uh, our process is really what we call plan. So plan is really around if an individual has identified that they want to, um, you know, start up this micro business, we go through the proper business planning process that much like any other small business would go through, but it is tailored down to the individual's needs and capacity. So it can take as long as they need, um, um, but we still do the same market research. We do the same customer segmentation. We still do the same um, investigation of cost of the products that they're making and all of those kinds of things. Um, and what we do at the end of that is we create two business plans if needed, one that makes sense to a financier or a bank or anything like that, and one that really um, is an accessible format so that that person um, has understanding and ownership of that document because it is ultimately theirs and their business. So that might be with infographics, easy read, whatever that individual needs, that's how we do it. From then, um, we also do the marketing plan. So, you know, getting them set up with their Facebook page so they can be on the directory, logos, you know, pricing, ticketing, all of those kinds of things that they might need to do as well. Um, the start portion of what we deliver is really basically you working with your 
um, say, business advisor, which is what we call our team, um, to start delivering your business, start building your business. So you might be doing letter drops, you might be doing attending, attending markets, you might be, um, you know, yeah, get, taking those bookings and selling that product. That's what this is about. At this point, you might also have a, um, a support worker who you're familiar with if you need it. Um, we call them business assistants because we want to be really clear that at this point, they are there to work on your business. It's not to go shopping or, you know, do any of the other things. We have to be really clear. Um, but that person can kind of help you with the day-to-day -day stuff and your advisor will help with the sort of overarching stuff and make sure you're ticking along okay. Um, sustain is uh, where we uh, as a team, as the Valued Lives team, is actually now starting to step back because you are up and running and you are running your business and you are doing all the things that you need to do. Still there for information and advice, but it might not be as often um, as you have in the beginning because you're up and you're running. Um, and we'll still be there to troubleshoot and all those sorts of things, but you have to remember our end goal is for you to not need us anymore. So that's why we do it the way that we do it. Um, the last one, launch, is probably my favourite, and that is where we can get someone to a point where they really don't need Valued Lives anymore. They're up and they're running, still part of our community, still part of events and, and everything like that, but now they might be looking at mentoring other people going through the process. So that's probably one of my favourites um, because, you know, they will have a lot to share with other people who are just starting out about some of the pitfalls and problem solving that they've done. So that's, um, yeah, I don't know, that and discovery are my two favourites. <laughs> um, okay, so I will just touch quickly on the NDIS because we all sort of interact, most of us in that space. Um, because sometimes, you know, your micro enterprise needs money to get started. So some of the options are under the NDIS are finding and keeping a job or school leaver employment supports for the younger folk up to 22 um, and that's in your capacity building budget so you can use that um, you can have planning conversations with with the NDIS about that so as long as you've got the only eligibility really is having an employment goal uh, and then you can have conversations with them about this um, they have now opened up supports in employment uh, in your core funding bucket so you could um, you could access it through there that's a little bit more flexible if you don't have the others already built into your capacity building um, and one of the other opportunities that are available is uh, once you've done your business plan um, you can go to um, uh, an organization over here we have one called one to one Inc and they uh, provide some seed funding that you might need to get equipment I think it's in the desert it's two thousand dollars isn't it yeah yeah two thousand dollars and you know people have used that to purchase business cards or um, sewing machines or brochures or you know anything that they might need to actually you know get things underway um, because we've shown the due diligence around the business plan and done all the feasibility and costing studies, then people can um, see that this is a real and well thought out business idea and get that seed funding. And the last one is uh, small business loans. Now, I know that many rivers, I'm pretty sure many rivers are available across the country um, and they do, um, that is a loan though, so that does need to be repaid at some point. Um, I'm pretty sure it's low interest, um, but the seed funding grants, uh, they don't need to be repaid. Um, and I'm sure there's probably lots of other options that I don't know about. <laughs> um, so we have been working together regionally and I think that, um, you know, the fact that we've all come together uh, in this um, forum that Matthew's facilitating really does show that there's a key interest across the country. So really, I should really put that working together nationally because we have learned through COVID that it is possible to deliver some of this stuff. Um, um, you know, it's transferable across the country and there are lots of ways that we can access that. Um, obviously video conferencing has been huge um, and what we've actually found with video conferencing that even here in the metro area lots of people have preferred to keep going with that 
rather than have to trek to Fremantle, which is a fair way away for a lot of our participants. And, you know, having to have a support worker drive them or find public transport, if they can just sit in their pyjama bottoms like, uh, you know, I might accidentally be today, um, <laughs> to, to um, you know, have a meeting, a business planning meeting with someone, then why not? You know, they, it's a better use of their resources. Um, so we do do phone meetings. We can, you know, obviously do bits and pieces via email. Um, it's on hold at the moment, but we'll be restarting in January. There's also a micro enterprise peer support group that we started up in COVID um, that was online. And it was just really an opportunity for people to get together and have chats about their business or, you know, ideas. We ran mini shark tank kind of things. Um, you know, it's just a, you know, a group of people um, getting together to chat about what they might want to chat about. I don't know. Um, and then one of the things that we're really, really keen to do is upskill local providers because, you know, I don't, we, we're only a small team. It's a big country. There's a lot of people who are interested in this. Um, so we're more than happy to have conversations and work in partnerships with other organisations across the country or schools or just like-minded people because, um, you know, we're not really into empire building. It's as, you know, we'd much rather see people have some really good outcomes. Um, so just a couple of stories of success that we've had. Um, and this is a pr probably the best bit of my entire presentation. And I'm going to show a couple of videos as well, if that's okay. Um, so we, uh, on the left there, um, it's kind of hard to see, but that's two separate photos on the screen, is uh, l and &E Designs. And they are a relatively new business that started up um, with, um, Matthew was just sort of, the brother is in the middle, was just ordered to be at the market on the day and do as he was told. But it's Lisa on the left and Lizzie uh, on the right uh, are the business owners of l and &E Designs. And, um, l &E Designs make uh, clothing protectors and makeup protectors for people with disability that does not look like the ones that you see in the nursing home. You know, I'm sure you've all seen those lovely navy blue and dark green tartan numbers that get sported around or the old towels that you see around people's necks. Lizzie wasn't, uh, Lisa wasn't having any of that. So they've um, design, uh, come up with this business and have some really funky designs. Um, Lisa is very, very much an integral part of that business and she approves fabric choice Choices, design uh, pro, um, prototypes and is, ve is a very key decision maker. Um, she's in her 20s and her sister Lizzie is 14 and I was recently in a YDAN conference with uh, Lisa and um, Lizzie where uh, somebody asked Lisa, uh, Lizzie sorry I always get it wrong, somebody asked Lizzie whether or not they'd be interested in taking on private investors They've been through our process and they're very, very, very much empowered and in control. And Lizzie's response was, sure, as long as they're quiet. Because they are very, very much in control and have ownership of that business. And that's exactly what we want to see. We do not want people giving over that empowerment to other people. Um, and then the, the gentleman on the right is another uh, uh, gentleman that Nadezh is working with at the moment. His name is Victor and he is in Derby in, in uh, the far north of Western Australia. He grew up on station out in the Fitzroy Valley and um, because of the nature of his disability, he wasn't really able to engage in some of the activities as as the other young gents uh, of the same age. And he spent a lot of time with the aunties who were learning how to sew. And he just loves it. And he's uh, well on his way to establishing his own clothing design business uh, with, um, he, he paints his own, it'll be his own or um, sourced from other artist uh, fabric. And um, he wants to make uh, some very stylish men's clothes. We met Victor in Derby and did a shark tank. And, um, you know, we went right through this whole idea of generation um, where he was down to organising suits with background printed, um, you know, fabrics and all kinds of stuff. He's really good. But he, um, he has a quote and I've, I've used it a few, you know, shared it a few times, but I'm really, um, it sticks with me. And, he says, I was born to live before I die and live I will. And I think that's really the crux of what we're trying to achieve in our microenterprise space is just to get people really empowered and engaged in this and um, have a bit of ownership, a lot of ownership over their own, um, their own lives. So um, 
I just want to finish up now with um, just a couple of videos, if that's okay. And then um, I'll open it up to, to questions for Nadej and myself to answer, because I think I've my PowerPoint long enough. Um, so I'll just stop sharing that one and I will start sharing a different screen. Watch me go with technology. Oh, um, okay. Right, and I will probably do, let's go to Benno's. There a couple of things we'll be following is crazy. There's fire and wheelchairs that don't go on too well. But I, I love to defy the odds. My name is Ben Shoes. I managed to start up a little business called Ben Ben. Before my accident, I didn't have a hard decent pain in my body. I first started off with grading, and I was just like a duck to water with that. I could spend two hours on something, I could spend eight hours on something. If I get my major on, I can't stop this. Um, I've got involved in the markets. I try to get my butt down here each Wednesday, just do a couple of hours. I've also, yeah, met so many other fantastic people who are life. Every day I'm learning something new. Uh, and one more. And then I'll just share a bit of background about Tia at the end of it. Yes, yeah. My best is an egg. My, my, my name is Tia. I'm the Manos. And my, my, my clothes go down. With um, I'm like, no, 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 There you go. So um, just last week, it feels like a lifetime ago, but just last week, um, Tia actually held a runway here in Perth, an inclusive runway. Um, I think, Nadege, I think at last count we had like 180 people there. Um, and it was Tia and another designer that we've been working with through the project and a couple of other um, designers, uh, Deadly Denim, Jarawi and Murray which are all Indigenous designers. And we hosted that, well, she hosted that in Fremantle. We just tagged along and lifted heavy things. It was all on Tia. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, got to showcase um, all of the designers um, and the designs that they'd all been working on. Um, and what was really cool about that, it was if you'd walked in the room, you would not have known that that was um, in any way, shape or form different to any other runway that's being held all over the world. It was fantastic. Um, Tia put that on because she was supposed to have been in Hawaii, but uh, yeah, thanks COVID. Um, and so she did this instead. And um, yeah, it was just, it's really, really fantastic because she was in control. Um, yeah, of the entire event, uh, the, a key decision maker and um, yeah, very much, um, yeah, empowered to, to do her thing. So, and um, she just put up with us, hanging dish. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I guess that's really it from me. Um, over to you guys, um, please ask me some questions. <laughs> um, in terms of applying for the NDI's grant for funding this project, I guess, what, what, were you, what did you, I guess, put into the, application to kind of show this was valuable and you know the NDIs should fund it I suppose. Yeah so that was a real challenge um, because back then employment wasn't a massive um, 
it wasn't really on the radar for the we didn't have the employment strategy or anything like that so um, we were kind of fortunate to have a little bit of evidence but what we have found in subsequent grant applications gather your evidence they especially now that the information linkages and capacity building has moved over to the department of social services rather than um, the uh, ndia themselves what is key is data so if you can gather some evidence about um, you know the lack of employment opportunities especially in a post-covid world which is why so many people are interested in micro enterprise um, if you can gather data around um, you know success rates or anything like that um, yeah data 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 is I just saw Nikki wrote that there it's it's key it's key um, and also what's really really important is co-design and making sure that nothing that you're putting in has you've not had conversations with people first i mean we're really lucky that we are the team that we are so we you know we experience those challenges we understand those challenges but we still do the co-design and make sure that um you know because we had to make some changes when we expanded the project so we had to make sure that what we were doing still fit both within the research that showed that it was sustainable but also that it was there for the people as well you know we weren't going to run off and create business plans that people with an intellectual disability had no understanding or ownership from so it had to be about co-design as well yeah but data 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 the ndis and the dss that's the language that they seem to speak <laughs> Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, yeah, just a bit of background, just because um, some founders, CEO of neurodiversity media, um, media company, you know, about um, creating resources for neurodivergent people at work. And I mean, I come from someone who's started micro enterprise myself in my first business, um, monetizing typewriter poetry of all things. Um, oh, cool. I'm hey, you need to advertise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm autistic ADHD and then I've got the second business now that's kind of taking up my time, at least it's a side hustle, right? But it's that micro enterprise and especially the arts as well. And what I I love about the examples you showed is just like people keep complaining you can't make money from art or stuff and I'm like no there you go like here's ex and there are people with disabilities like what you're talking about so yeah that's it. one of the businesses that we have is actually a, a composer by by trade and she creates songs and poetry for people as gifts yeah exactly there's a market for that like it's yep. it's amazing so i guess what's really interesting though is i've been approached recently um and i know there's an ndis grant coming up on the 8th of december um <laughs> looking into that yep. area and Lovely so life. that's why I've, yeah and it's funny it's just kind of been approached by you know um uh, someone from agribusiness you know agriculture you know wandering to mentor um young people or autistic mm -hmm. people in rural remote areas and mm -hmm. kind of was saying well that I know that priority cohorts in this grant seem to be young people and rural remote areas. So I feel like we should join forces. But then I guess what I have a challenge right now is trying to figure out how do you justify this financial part of that grant? You know, like how much money you put aside for whatever, how you calculate that, because it's just sort of really confusing. Yep. Yeah, okay. So it's funny because we just had this conversation today. Um, <laughs> so um, some of the things that you need to think about when you're putting together your grant, um, you need to think about obviously um, that if you're doing something in a regional and remote area, it's going to be bigger than what you think. Okay, so if you're thinking that it's going to be a half, half a full-time job, give yourself the room for a full-time job because that is an area for us where there's massive, massive amounts of growth because there isn't anything. When you think about thin markets for the NDIS, but you've also got poorer employment opportunities. So give yourself more time than you think you're going to need. All right. The other thing is you need to make sure that you put in um, all the stuff, you know, your equipment, your travel, your, um, you know, when you travel, uh, give yourself the opportunity to um, eat. You know, it's a little thing, but it makes a big difference. Thinking yeah. about venue hires and stuff like that. There's a lot, especially in country towns, there's a lot of venues that you can access for free or very cheap because people will be really excited that you're here. Um, but, you know, you still need to accommodate for that. Um, think about your tax and your super. So, again, this is a conversation we've been having. For a project, we tend to put the wages plus 25% because tax and super you know those sorts of things um have a look at what the market rates are for similar jobs out there because if it's not going to be you that's doing it you want to make sure you attract quality people um, and then also make sure 
that you're not overloading yourself in your grant application in terms of, you know, if you're a person with a disability or you're neurodiverse, you don't want to be overloading yourself to the point where you're burning out. All right. And I'm going to put, and, and Nadesh will agree, I, hand on heart, I am the worst offender. <laughs> right? Absolutely. I am neurodiverse. I am the worst offender. And she's always telling me stop it. And so you really have to think about, you know, what can you deliver in, in, a, in, in a, a way that's kind to you? Yeah. The other thing we've noticed about the ILC is that they, um, they, they like the idea of you not having to repeatedly go to places. So if you can access things like online technology and things like that, um, it seems to be more attractive to them when they're not having to continually pay money for flights and things like that. Also think really, really hard about the post-COVID stuff, how this will assist post-COVID recovery. There's a reason that that is in there so much. They have this competing thing around the national disability strategy, which means we want to get people into jobs and there's no jobs. So think about when you're applying, how that might benefit that as well as just the priority cohorts yeah no that's super helpful because yeah. um yeah it's kind of really confusing oh, grant writing is right. and you're just like how much do i apply because i know it's sort of between 250 to 1.2 million you go oh god yeah. and then over 12 months and they're like how are you going to justify that because yeah. you can apply for that and then it'd be like now nah, we're going to half that or they don't give it to well, you well no if you okay so if you put in an application for that much and you're successful it will be for that much there's no renegotiating of the funds okay so make sure you cover everything because you can't go up and they won't take it out of your application. If you're funded, if you're accepted, it'll be for that amount. The other thing I want you to think about is, is there's a really good reason why they've put sustainability past the grant. That's important too, all right, because it is only 12 months. Hmm. All right, so think about how much you can realistically deliver, remembering that the first three months is usually the setup and then you've got the little bit and then you've got the evaluation and and fit up at the end um so you know be really kind to yourself <laughs> yeah no be right. autistic and ADHD, i totally understand i you know so right. still, <laughs> I'm autistic too, still so. recovering from burnout myself so i'm really slow about it and literally the only reason because i've been avoiding grants the whole time and just trying to generate revenue by sales but then you know i was like okay there's this opportunity and this maybe yeah. i'll have a go but you know it turned out you're on tonight and i was like well why not i may as well ask yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that's really useful. Um, one last question for I sort of, sorry, everyone can ask question, but the yeah. evaluation part, I don't understand that bit in terms of like how you're going to evaluate it. So is it costing it for like a survey to be done? Like how does evaluation, what are they looking for, I suppose? So we use surveys a lot. Um, is it the like at scale, so Nadej? No, so Nadej is really interested in data. So this is a question for her. <laughs> Yeah, so you can have um, surveys throughout, so you can collect like a, a mix of qualitative and quantitative da data. Um, we also employed Renee, who's here, we consulted with Renee. Oh, hi Renee! Yeah, who's done a lot of work on um, micro-enterprises in the southwest over the last lo long while now. Um, but we actually in, in engaged her as a consultant to do an independent evaluation of, of the project. Yep. So that's something that can be funded out of the grant as well. I think Renee probably is actually the one that should be having a bit of a I didn't realise she was here. Yeah. <laughs> so, Con, Renee, you're up. It's not going to end up. Sorry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so the um, evaluating the grant, I mean, obviously it depends on what you have requested. So w uh, every time you're thinking of an idea and a request, always just have in your mind, well, how would I measure that? This can be really, really tricky because, yeah, Valued Lives and I started off when no one was doing it. So now it's really great. You do have Valued Lives data, um, the ecosystem report that I just put in the, in the chat bar as well. So you've got some real, um, you've got some data you could draw from. So what I would suggest is also go on to um, the BCLW. So that's Building Local Care Workforce. Go on to their, um, they call it it's mapping. Mag map. mapping. Mm. Yeah, and find out how many people 
you have in your area who have a disability who may end up going on to the NDIS at some point in the future. Um, you can find out their age range. So you can talk about these, there's a certain amount of people, 15 to 64 years old, who um, we're, could potentially fall into that 53% of unemployed people with disability. Um, you know, and you can figure out those, those numbers with whatever region you're in. So then you can say, if we plan to deliver, you know, to 300 people workshops across a 12 month period, um, you know, you can start to work out um, what you're asking for there. Then you need to set up a survey beforehand and a survey after and really keep the contact details of the people that you interact with. Um, and then the beauty of you guys getting a grant now and sort of kicking off in different areas is you've got valued lives and you've got people that have gone before you that you can write into the grant, um, you know, some funds for that mentorship or funds for that, those present presenters who can just hit the ground running for you and mentor you through the process. So you're not coming up with your own material for, and then trying to roll it out because that's not realistic in 12 months. Yeah, no, actually that's a really good point. Just um, like, yeah, in terms of data, data, data as mentioned, like actually using you guys as an example. So that was a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. And all of and, that is useful. And one of the, the reporting questions that comes through the grant is what are your stories so the videos that we showed you we'll have more soon they're just in production but um you know being able to actually share the story of change of the impact that's important too so you know choose a few participants and get to know them gather the information the story and about their life or about you know what life is like now and then go back and revisit that because one of the things they ask you in reporting is well tell us about the impact tell us about the story of change yeah no that's no that's so super awesome yeah because um for me i feel like i do it informally like you know obviously i started my first business and in this business i employed um someone with adhd and she learns visual scribing and then she's now spun that off to her own business so that's her micro enterprise but she was kind of like incubated in my business ran like more like a separate arm of my business and then she decided to go off and you know so it's kind of interesting like a slightly different model but sort of similar concept so um yeah no it's really exciting and kind of wanted to make sure there's more sustainability behind it yeah, look, um, the whole point of what we do is around sustainability because when life happens, therapy needs, someone gets ill, kiss support needs change, your NDIS plan didn't go so well or whatever it might be, employment is often the first thing to fall over and our the point of us or the point of what we've done is we've always had a very clear goal to not be needed and that's our culture is that we've done a great job if we're not some people will always need support and that's okay but as long as we can say hand on heart we've built this business for, with someone as sustainable as they can be and the key point is with not for um, it doesn't then fall back on the family who's got everything else going on the individual is the center and have control of that so you know that it has to be that otherwise you know COVID will happen and the whole thing falls over or you know I don't know or they're just not interested anymore and you know that does happen no matter what happens you know you might get like none of us stays in a job for the rest of our lives we get sick of it but you know as long as that's down again to individual choice and it's not being built that's reliant on support workers and coordinators and this that and the other then that's you know that's the end goal. Yeah, and then, and another thing is, um, like what Yvonne sent a link of that uh, demand, mate. So it's really good about what you're expecting in the future. So it can not try to do the forecast, but if you what you see in the data, the expectation, it really helps your case on what your intention, the project or the program you're working on. And that we can see where you're getting your market from, and that will come in that information in. So it's very useful. It's got a big map. It's covered a whole entire country. And it's just got like, for example, um, I've got to go to um, my local area. Uh, 
data, data. Again, it's a lot of loading under that map. But while you're, <laughs> Takes while time. you're looking for that map, so. the other data source that you can use, is everybody familiar with the NGIS's data website? So if you, it, it's, oh God, I had it up today. It's, uh, yeah, that's another thing that can bring it up too. Yeah. So they have, um, it's, the quarterly updates. Yeah. And stuff. So it's, yeah. um, I think it's data at NDIS. If you just Google NDIS data website, it'll come up and you can actually have a look at by region, by age group, by disability type, by a whole heap of things. Um, what's happening in your area as well, which is another really useful skill. Another good data set as well, um, particularly if you're targeting people that don't have NDIS plans but have disability and ILC grants, um, the, DES, the DES monthly reporting. So one of the stats in the most recent report for people in, in 52 week placements in their jobs, that's down 26% from the same time last year. So it's showing that there's, there's a massive lack in job, job retention. So, yeah. I like data. She does love data. She loves it. <laughs> I like to talk. <laughs> oh, any other questions? Oh, thanks, Yvonne, for putting the data website up. No? Well, I mean, I could always keep asking questions. I mean, this whole okay. process is new to me, so I'm asking you, know, you, can, you can keep going on it. Um, I think because Nikki touched on it about, you know, how many people you were going to assist when you applied, and at the time okay. you had 30 people, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Just kind yeah. of curious to know how you would, how do you quantify? I guess we mentioned by stats, right? So it's sort of yeah. like, will you quantify it according to you're focusing yeah. on one particular disability or versus a geographic area? Yeah, how would you yeah. quantify that? So, okay, so some of that came from um, obviously previous activity um, and the size of the team, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think anyone could have predicted that we would get to this level. I certainly didn't. <laughs> um, and I don't think Nadej did or Renee did either. Oh my God. Um, but I think you've got, you've got to remember this, the grant that you're talking about is only for 12 months, all right? So if you're going to do something, remember that it's going to take six to 12 months to get people through this stuff. And I mean, I don't know what your idea is. I'm just saying, like, if I was to write a grant now, I would make sure that I don't allow enough, like I do allow enough for everyone to get good support and, you know, it's okay to over deliver and under promise. Don't over promise and under deliver, if that makes sense, right? Um, unless, you know, something happens. I mean, at, at, in March, when we went into lockdown, I was kind of going, oh boy, I don't know how we're going to meet these people. But the opposite happened. So it's much better to come to you at the end of your grant and say, I actually helped X amount of people more than I thought than, than not. Um, one of the things that we learned. And uh, is that, you know, we, because we are who we are, we didn't want to say no to anyone and quick, very quickly the team got, you know, the drowning. Um, because we had no data about what was actually required per person to work out a caseload. So we kind of just kept saying yes until everybody started waving the white flag. <laughs> so <laughs> we've learned from that. We won't do that again. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I think the 30 for us with the team that was built into the grant was conservative. Um, I think 100 people plus is too many. Um, so, you know, just be, if, but it is better to, um, to over deliver. Yeah, that probably doesn't really help you much, but, you know, oh, do no, have no. a look at, yeah. pick a region, look who's in the region and, you know, think about who, what you've got capacity to deliver if it's going to be you that's delivering the grant. Yeah, it's interesting because, yeah, I've got sort of two different sort of projects that could go and it, it kind of depends. One is the agriculture um, potential project, which they've already had an idea of the mentoring and coaching. And it's like specifically autistic young people in rural areas that they want to connect with employers, yeah. that kind of thing. So it could be super specific and they've got connections all around the country, Agribusiness uh, Council. And so there could be that nationwide thing, but it's just in that cohort of autistic you know, people in that rural area. Um, yeah. But then, you know, I've got the other alternatives in my current sort of business where I do sort of like to employ more neurodivergent people to create resources in my library. So yeah. Um, that's, yeah. So, so, so what, what you might think about in that instance is maybe not saying I'm going to support X amount of people, 
right? Because you don't know, the numbers might not be there. Um, in the other grant that I manage, which is the peer support grant, we actually didn't say how many people we were gonna provide information and support for. What you need to show, and if you have a look at, um, for the social and economic participation, the social grant, it's where's the need, which you can actually find really easily. So, you know, if you're not 100% sure and you're really struggling with quantifying how many individuals you're going to support, instead focus on the need and where the gaps are. Um, and then, you know, that's a piece of data that you can use instead. I mean, listen, I'm not a professional grant writer, okay? I'm just giving you my insights on what we've learned along the way. So, it's really, Nadege, it's really valuable. <laughs> now, Nadege and I together have worked in a couple of different roles. And what would this be, like six grants we've worked on now? Six applications, something like that. Yeah, that, see that Grave Street right there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Better than uh, zero for me, so. <laughs> yeah, but th listen, we're, like I said at the beginning, we're not here to empire build. We just want everybody to have good outcomes. So, And we'd much rather see um, people with diversity do it than providers. <laughs> Look, Don't I mean, take the grant process is already crazy enough, even by, like, I have to read the easy read guidelines to even understand it. And oh, I'm like, and, I, and I go, you're okay, it's just so dense. I'm like, and just, the, you know, I tried to do a grant before in the past and I was like, I gave up because I was just like, it's just too much. So. Yeah, it's a lot. so just, yeah, but just remember to be kind to yourself about what you think you can deliver. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I've definitely, and I've got the contact details in Zoom, so I'm happy to send yeah, you yeah. an email if you're happy to proofread my grant application. <laughs> oh, why not? Probably super Google will do it, but yeah, that's fine. Um, so if the, so Nikki's asked a question, if the initial cohort was 30, did they all start at once or did each person start at different times? They, they've all started at different times. They've come along the way. Um, you know, during COVID, uh, I think we... Uh, got 14 referrals in a week. Um, the average is um, about eight a week. Um, unfortunately, we're having to, we can't support everyone now. Um, but, um, you know, it, they did start at different times. So we found that, you know, there was like a rush around school leavers, you know, so people are starting to get to the end of the school leaver process and they're going, oh God, what are we going to do now? Um, we found we had a lot of interest after we'd done certain events um, or, you know, there's certain um, um, information leak, uh, uh, released by the NDIA. Um, uh, Renee and I did some training of our local area coordinators and all of a sudden that boosted the interest, but thankfully they didn't all come up. <laughs> Yeah, we might have been a bit smarter about our numbers if we if they'd all come at once, but they kind of just crept in. <laughs> and next thing you know, we're like, oh. <laughs> I think what's happened is um, when you attract something very different, creative, never done before, and non-competitive, so that's what make it really interesting. So, um, and that's it's about the change centered of the system. Uh, like, okay. You got like traditional employment services. Look at what had that done for a year. Okay, we can all argue about that. So you think about what's yeah. so different about and the track funding to. So you got it. It's like we talk about data and data that why do you have create um, opportunity to crunch those numbers as well. So that will give you a positive mm -hmm. result and outcome. So you're kind of like thirty to the hundred five. That is big jump. It's just because um, the opportunity you can see, I'm not sure if you might see the NGA demand map before you got to the 105. It could come from there. So if you had explored a little bit more, you could have ended up getting yourself paid more than when you had to pay that 30 because you're still going to pay 30 and 105. So that's quite overwhelming. Mm. So, um, but it's, it's nice to have a bit of ballpark at the beginning to like what should what Claire say, it's a bit conservative number to to be sure that we have a baseline. So if you over over commitment or over um predicting in the number, um that that might not gonna get anywhere you'd expect it. So that's mean the work performance. Yeah. So yeah. So the it's other, like the KPI how do totally you challenge them, you know. The other yeah. thing that we did experience that I've just twigged on to, it takes me a while this time in the afternoon, but um, was that when the grant was written, we didn't have full transition here in WA of the NDIS. We've only just achieved that. And so in our uh, WA version of the NDIS and our block funding model, there wasn't really support for this kind of stuff. So 
um, it's only as the NDIS has become available in more regions if, of WA uh, that, you know, that employment, this model of flexible employment support has been available. So under previous models, you went to an ADE or you went to a DES or you went to what was called um, um, alternative ATE, which was alternatives to employment, which was your day programs where this sort of stuff was never generated. So, you know, part of that has become from from the fact that it's now available. So, you know, the data that built the, the 30, I wasn't there when the original grant was written, um, was kind of informed by really where we were as a state in terms of our funding models. Um, so, uh, Nikki has asked, did we have a mix of non-NDIS and NDIS? Yes, we did. Um, and we also had a mix of people who had uh, employment supports in their plan and didn't. Um, so um, over time, we've worked with Renee and her counterpart to develop a um, pretty comprehensive report that um, goes right down to the line item, so LACs don't have to worry about thinking about it. Um, but it's built around the individual um, to to really help people get to a point of getting some funding in their plan. That might come from showcasing the discovery records, showcasing what they're already doing and they need support for that to continue. Um, but yeah, we were lucky enough to um, be able to support people both with and without. Some people I think got access or transferred in whilst they were working with us. Um, so yeah, it's been a real mix. And some people um, may never, you know, get in there and you know I, I would like to hope that one day in the future we have the luxury of report of working with people from other cohorts as well not just people from with the disability are we asking a fee from participants uh, we did not while we were running the project however um, as we're moving forward um, we if uh, we are now accessing funding from people's plans but that is there is no other cost associated with that can so I just you, ask a question around that? Yes, yeah, it's sure. a little bit. It's a little bit of an NDIS -y sort sure. of question. <laughs> um, now, I did notice that you did say that um, people that could access this would either have to have that SLES funding or some mm -hmm. sort of economic participation style funding. Now, what about if you know, say, for instance, one of your goals is it is to run your own business and and yep. have a, a, you know economic participation or design your own job or whatever you want yep. to call it. Um, but you don't get the SLES funding because SLES funding is just not going to work for you because you have a significant disability. Yeah. Um, what you, you can still use your core funding because you've got a support person taking you to the. So I think that's that gets really confusing for some people. I think they can't access these things. I've had friends. So there's a, there's a couple of things about that. So um, a lot of the people we work with will not be able to work with a DES and will not fit an uh, Australian yep. an ADE. They don't. You know, yep. we've got people with um, very complex behaviours of concern or challenging behaviours, yep. very high physical support needs, um, um, intellectual intellect. You, we yeah. don't, it doesn't matter. We work with whoever. So we That's have right. people at both ends of the spectrum. So um, people can, if, if the, in terms of the finding and keeping a job, it just really needs to be that you have an employment goal. That's your eligibility. Yeah, probably. yeah. But if they yeah, have So you don't have to fight for this. Uh, you know, I mean, I haven't had to personally uh, for my son. I just use the core, core funding. Yep. But... Um, you know, so many people are a little confused about that because they think, oh, you know, employment sits with that SLES thing, but that's not yes. necessarily the case. No. No, so with the core supports now, that, that supports in employment is now a new align item. So people can say, that's what I want to purchase out of my plan. Well, as a, as a self-manager, we don't use those line items, so it doesn't no, no. matter. No, no. Yeah. That's, and that's, yeah, but it's, it's absolutely available there, whereas it maybe yeah, wasn't cool. before. So, yeah. 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 So that I means you can, as a business, as yourself, or, you know, as the model that you have, you have, you have scope for many more people other than just people that get a certain type of funding. Yeah. And I guess that's the question I wanted to know. And that's awesome that more people can, yeah. can, uh, can connect so, with that. All along, 
we've yeah. had a so, view towards making this sustainable past the life of the project because we didn't want to go right everyone see you done and dusted we're off you know so um yeah it's been we had a bit of that conversation back in the September um, meeting. So it was somebody from NDI asked me a question. So I brought it up that um, because I'm self-managing my brand, I use um, customized employment support, which is the new line of category oh. that is under employment support. Okay. So if we're self-managed, you can do anything what you yeah. want but still reasonable and necessary yes, yes, to validate yes, the yes, yes. Yeah, and I think... Even that, that's pretty straightforward. Yeah. It's your choice. Yeah. You also got a choice in control. Yeah. And, so, and you yeah. Anyways, you've got to get a right out of time. Yeah, so that's right. We've gone over time. So, well, so um, Claire yeah, uh, and um, Nage, um, I really, really appreciate you having time tonight and this evening in your time. No so, um, so you have shared your contact details. <laughs> so, um, probably, yeah, you already did, yeah. So um, it's happening. If everyone had more questions about um, the project and all and the uh, related uh, grant funding question, um, it's really important to keep it in communication with. And um, it's very, very interesting. And I'm really, really pleased how far you guys go uh, because uh, we need more of that, especially on the other side of the country. And and and, and it, it there's a lot of potential in, in this space. That's what I'm hoping for and yeah. see all the achievement through the system. Yeah. So, um, because I work at a place called Jigsaw in Australia, it's a disability um, employment service, it's a social enterprise. Um, they, they have people learn about soft skills and all that kind of stuff, getting into the workforce. So these people are not comfortable going with the DES, uh, ADEs or related things. It is very much the same thing, but it's not about self-employment. It's, it can be a project of that, but hey, I'm a trainer, so I'm hoping these people will skill up their soft skills. Um, it's very inspiring. There's just so much potential because it's so creative. So um, mm. unfortunately, this is going to be a last one of the year. So I hope you come back in February next year. So um, it's worth keeping in touch with everyone and. I, will, I really hope you all have a great Christmas and New Year. Yeah. I will come back and fresh. Please to be 2021, not another 2020. You know what I mean? So yeah. I hope we get the ball rolling. <laughs> yeah. So, and, um, um, yeah, and thanks for having yeah. us, Matt. Yeah. Um, we really appreciate it. And if anyone wants to, does want to have more conversations, please let us know. Um, and also, we're allowed out of WA now, so if you want us to come and visit, we're, we're always up for that, aren't we, Nadej? <laughs> so. We're just open in Queensland, too, yeah, so they can come here, too. <laughs> we've decided to rejoin the rest of the country uh, now, so, but uh, in all seriousness, guys, if there's yeah. anything we can do, um, we're all about spending, spreading the microenterprise love, so please get in touch. Awesome. And thanks for having us, Matt. Yeah. Thank, awesome. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, have a good night. See ya.